Yeah, I can hear you very well. Very good. Very good. We still have some people in. I'm trying. I will be here for a while, but because I'm still in the conference, if they took. Yeah, like that is better. So people who have RT on, on them, they are just entering using Rowan's link. So fix your, your name. Okay. A lot of RT, so I just write for everyone. RT. I wonder what that means. Uh, this is Rowan. She's helping them enter into the program. They use her link. Oh, okay. So just, we want them to change the name. Who is using RT, please fix your name. Yeah, they're changing their names. I forgot my headset, and this was one of the problems as well. Professor Gavin, is it okay to wait for a couple of minutes? Absolutely. I'm good. I'll be back and just tell me when to come on. I'll be right here. اللي عنده ار تي حط اسمه يعدل اسمه انا مش عارف مين مين هم Yeah, can you change it to your real name instead of RT? Just click and make change rename and put your name instead. So my name is obviously Reset. Do you see my name? Yes, there's no problem with my name. Yeah, okay, good. Dr. Iyad, I'm not quite sure how to turn off the mic at your end. Indiana? Oh. لا عندي أنا في المكتب عندك. You're muted. جرب المايك او السماعات الساوند محطوط اوف هذا ميوت بس المايك في مشكله ما اعرف شو القصه اوكي
بني عشان انت عشان هذا بلنا خلص Who is this guy who has no name? Please insert your name. If you can, uh, please insert your name. Be good. Okay, let's Now we are still muted. Uh, I think we are ready now. I think it's enough 17 to 10. Let's try it. Professor Mark, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. I think we should start. It's 2.10. I guess it's a good time to start. I can stay for another one hour and then I have to head to my car, to the car who will pick me up because there's no trains yet. There's a guy who's going to pick me in one hour to get me back to Jena. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm stuck in somewhere in, in East Germany. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. In the conference, uh, it's a, it's not a it's a retreat for ITP for the University of Vienna. So it's only one day, but the problem there's no trains to go back. Well, it, it's much better than being stuck there sixty years ago. So that's good. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we are starting our doctoral school. Thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, doctoral session, and. Uh, we would like to welcome uh, our dear professor, Mark Gopin. He's uh, dear to us and he's one of the Armina's pillar and always with us in every se semester and we learn from him a lot and we're happy to have him. So professor, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I have circulated your article, the new article which is being published in the book. The book will be out in uh, February and I circulated the article to everyone to read it. So they have some information about what you are going to talk. Okay. So, I'll give a broader context and the way that I um, like to work, I think almost everybody's name is here. Uh, there's one person where it says, please insert your name. Um, uh, Kim, maybe you can change. Kim, I know her. Uh, Kim, change your name. I will do it. I know Kim. Okay, good. All right. And so everybody else is from your, can you just uh, describe to me? Me, uh, since you're on the line, Dr. Yad, um, the the nature of this class, where everybody is from, where they're sitting. So this, uh, you know, it's a doctoral school, as you know, and they are all trying to apply for the doctoral school, writing their proposals. So it's according to the program, they have to attend a semester, and within that semester, they write the research. Uh, five pages of the research, and then in the second semester, they attend the doctoral school and they write a 20-page proposal. And then they apply for two professors in the field, uh, in Yana and the doctoral school to be applied as a PhD student. So you know, some, of, some of them are accepted as PhD students. We have eight students accepted, and some of them are not yet not accepted. We call them preconditioned until they get the acceptance from uh, from two professors and the doctoral school. So they can attend uh, during the, the process. So this is uh, how who they are mostly. They're all PhD and, students. Some of them are accepted, but some of them are still not accepted. And, you know, as the professors come into the program, they, they publish in Armina, and at the same time, they give lectures as well. So we bring uh, guest speakers all, all the time, every time. Who people who published with us, they come and give lectures in front of the doctoral school, and the doctoral school also, the students, they also present their work, but that's at the end of the semester. We have two sessions for all the students, the preconditioned and the PhD students where they present their work. So this in this seminar, we have two seminars, two semesters. So it's about adaptivity. So we did our first book, this Reconciliation and Conflict Transformation Peace Studies book, and now we are doing the adaptivity book which we want to work on. That's what I wanted to tell you. So all the professors who will who will uh, speak in this two semesters, they can apply for an article in the Adaptivity in Reconciliation and Peace Study. This is the name of our second book to be published after this one, the fifth book. So this is how we are doing it. So I just tell you how it's working. Okay. So when you went into the PhD program, you saw many professors who are speaking in each session. They are have articles with us. And they speak, so we publish for them. So this is okay. how we're doing. And where are the students located right now? So different places. Uh, maybe they can, if you like, they can introduce this, uh, themselves if you like. What do I you think, think I, I think I, I don't know what your custom is in the previous uh, sessions, but I'd very much like to be. I only see um, five, four students on my screen, but there yeah. are twenty people participating. Yeah, I think they could open their cameras if they like. Uh, please open your cameras. It's better just for five minutes so we can see you all. Yeah, yeah. and then we can put it off afterwards. Yeah. So just to let the professor see who you are. And I don't know, some yeah, everyone put his camera on for a while just to, to let us see who is who. Oh, yeah. so, okay. So now they can introduce themselves. I, 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 um, okay, so, um, I don't know which order. I see. Uh, let me just ask people. Uh, Rima. Yes, Professor. Hello. My name is Rima. I am from Armenia, and uh, I have uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in uh, Arabic studies. 
So, um, and I, I also know Arabic language, so I'm very much interested in doing PhD is in this field, which uh, will allow me to uh, uh, to do research in depth and in detail regarding uh, conflict between Israel and Palestine, and um, uh, to see the ways of reconciliation and peace building. So, um, uh, where I can put my experience and gain new knowledge uh, from this program. So that's why I'm here and uh, right. thank you professors for uh, accepting me to this program. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Jean-Marie. Uh, mute. Um, yes, thank you. Um, Zabimana Jamari. Now from Burundi, uh, Burundi is East Africa. So um, I have bachelor, I have bachelor in theology, and also I have masters in education from Bamberg University. And now I have a project about reconciliation here in Burundi. Thank you, um, uh, Kimberly. Hi, my name is Kimberly Harris. Um, I live in New York City, and my interests are really how trauma um, presents differently in older adults. That's been a lot of my work in the past, and I'm exploring the idea of writing about how that affects reconciliation processes. So I, I didn't catch the first word. What what presents? A trauma. Trauma. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rowan. Is there an echo? Can you hear me now perfectly? I can. Okay, perfect. So my name is Rowan Tahu. I'm a PhD student actually um, at the Ermina, in the Ermina office right now. Uh, I work on using virtual exchange as a mechanism for reconciliation processes. And my work is related to the intra-Palestinian uh, conflict, so a Palestinian-Palestinian reconciliation. Okay, thank you. Um... Fahed, uh, mute, mute, mute. Hello, Doctor. Hello. My name is Fahed Jabber. I'm from Jordan. Uh, I hold master degree in law. I'm a lawyer in Jordan since uh, eight years. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, huh. RT. Uh, RT is so uh, Haifa. Uh, I think she, her name is Haifa. Just a moment, Haifa. You need to change your name because you entered with Rowan's link. So I will write her name here, Haifa. <clears throat> so you can introduce yourself. Uh, mute. You, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so hello. I am Haifa Benfres. I am uh, from Tunisia. I have a bachelor degree in applied languages uh, in business and economy. And I also studied uh, anthropology, social and cultural anthropology. And I have a master degree in um, uh, design for sustainable uh, development. I am interested uh, in the uh, program because I wish to work uh, on uh, the relationships between uh, uh, Morocco and uh, Tunisia, especially in the Abbasid uh, era, and that's all. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, uh, Muhammad Abdurrahi Ab Abdurrahman. Yeah, how are you, bro? My name is Muhammad Abdurrahman. I am Egyptian resident of Qatar. I have a master degree in social psychology. I work at uh, uh, Supreme Ju uh, Judiciary Council as a social, uh, social psychologist. And uh, uh, this is uh, this program is related to my work because I work in uh, conflict settlement uh, among families here in Qatar in family court. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Jack. Hi, Professor. My name is Jack Tawasi. I'm from Jerusalem. Um, I work in the security sector reform with the Palestinian Authority Security Services under the United States Security Coordinator Program. 
I have a master's degree in human resources management and development. And my focus was on the psychology of motivation. So what makes people tick? And this is what I'm looking forward in developing in my uh, doctoral research on how to find common grounds between the Palestinians and Israelis to move into reconciliation, uh, conflict transformation, something similar to the Northern Ireland uh, approach as well. Over. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, second. Uh, Omar Abdel, Abdel, Abdel. Yes, Omar Abdel Salam. Abdel Salam. Yes, I'm Omar Abdelsalam. I had a master in conflict management and humanitarian studies. I'm from Egypt, uh, but I am based in Qatar. Uh, I am a specialist in Islamic philanthropy. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bashar. Hello, everybody. My name is Bashar. I'm from Syria. I I graduated from political science college and I had a master degree in Islamic and Christian relationships. And now I'm trying to study the status in its relation to reconciliation in the context of Syria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Khaled. Hello, everyone. My name is Khalid Mansour. I'm from Palestine. I got a bachelor's degree in French language and translation and a master's degree from Germany in European studies. And I'm a PhD student in intercultural business communication in Jena. And I'm studying cultural dynamics and reconciliation in Palestine. Hey, okay, thank you very much. Al Hassan Tahir. Yeah, my name is Al Hassan Tahiru. I have a bachelor's in development studies, a master's in peace and conflict studies. I'm interested in the communal violence and inter-ethnic conflicts and how to mm -hmm. near peace building among uh, conflicting parties. I'm working on the projects that has to do with the interpretation of terror towards the legitimization and delegitimization of violence. And so I'm here to see how I can also join the program in order to see how translation works in the context of inter-ethnic conflicts. Wonderful. Um, uh, did you say interpretation of text? Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, Nawal, uh, sorry, Lawal Salha. Uh, um, I'm Lawal Salha from Northwestern Nigeria in Zamfara State. I have a BSc in mass communication <clears throat> from American University Zaria, and I have a master's in media, peace, and conflict studies from the United Nations uh, University. Police. And I'm here hoping to be accepted to uh, study the PD in reconciliation. Thank you, sir. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Rashid. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, I I called on you. Are you are you, uh, can you introduce yourself? Hello. Yeah, uh, communications is not working with that. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Rashid Bouajila. I'm a T Tunisian jurist. My uh, master thesis was about uh, rabbinic law before uh, French uh, courts in uh, Tunisia in uh, uh, colonial period. But actually, I'm looking for a PhD dissertation uh, related to uh, international uh, water law, uh, specifically the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer System as a case study of uh, international water law and policy. And thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, I uh, can't see uh, anyone else that hasn't been introduced. So maybe that's everybody. 
Yeah, so so me. Yeah. Uh, doctor. Yes. Do you hear uh, me? Yeah. Yes, please go ahead, yeah. Abdul Razak. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is Abdul Razak Msoudi. I'm from Morocco. A a I had a master degree, two master's degree, one in uh, applied linguistics in English language, and then the other one in um, in Arabic linguistics and uh, lex lexicography, and another executive master's from uh, Padova University in uh, religion politics and global society. So I'm interested in civic engagement and how we can apply it as an approach to uh, peace building, uh, transformation, uh, and reconciliation. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the latest RT. Uh, let's see. There's an RT. Um, Yad, I see an RT that is not identified. Yeah. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, if we got your name. Uh... The guy who has RT with us, Mir Lawal. Can you introduce yourself, your name? I don't know if he can hear us. Like, no, I don't know. Uh, a gentleman, uh, you have a very colorful um, shirt. Uh, and uh, could you introduce yourself? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. And, Thank and, you very uh, much. I will change your name from RT to your name. Okay, my, uh, thank you very much. My name is Matthew Bayoloa Tevison. I am from Nigeria. I got first degree. My first degree, I study um, education English, and my second degree with my master's. I did adult education and lifelong learning. I have been opportunity. Click on the manual and uh, the word manual I put under your name and change it to your name because I couldn't hear your name. Well, to Matthew, exactly. Great. Okay, it's a weak connection. Um, you can put off your camera, you might connect better. Okay, I don't want to take too much time. I think that's everybody. Uh, if anybody was not introduced, please uh, raise your hand electronically. I think I, I know how to see that. Uh, and, and in general, um, I'll speak and then um, you can prepare questions uh, uh, in this in this group of size. Try your questions will be uh, less than a minute um, unless we go deeper and deeper in the discussion later on. Um, and. Basically, um, I'll talk for a while, then I'll ask for questions, and then I'll talk again, and we'll proceed that way. And we might do some small group work as well. Um, we have until uh, we have until um, another hour and a half, correct? And do you ever take a break in the middle, Doctor? Yeah, Yad? we take a break in in the middle. You can tell us whenever you, you after your lecture, you take a break, and then we open discussion. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. So you can so give a lecture for one hour and then the five minutes break, and then we go back if you like. Right. And we have, oh, Dr. Laura. Hi, my old student. Nice to see you. Professor okay. Gopin, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. Nice. Wonderful to see you. That's great. Okay. Um, let's see. So let me begin uh, by introducing, uh, you know, the, the, all of the these there's many interconnected subjects that all of you are interested in and that we raised and reconciliation is a very um particular interesting and frustrating uh aspect of the field of uh social change positive social change in the broadest terms um we have to think about I'll introduce myself uh, after but I I I just want to get some thoughts out about where we're situated in the field. You know, whenever you're not doing a hard science, you're doing a soft science, it's not so easy to locate exactly where you are on a spectrum and also to extrapolate what exactly it is that we are doing, what are we studying, and what are we a subset of? What is the larger category? 
So some of those larger categories for some of us, uh, my trajectory has been uh, has been in the last um, uh, 20 years uh, has been the trajectory of um, or 25 years has been the trajectory of conflict analysis and conflict resolution. And that's a particular framing of the field that came about um, up in the 1980s. And it was a combination of trying to understand from a scientific point of view, the roots of conflict and uh, looking at it through the lens of multiple fields at once. And it has, um, it has challenged and changed uh, the academia uh, and practitioners because conflict analysis cuts across many fields of human analysis going back uh, thousands of years. So uh, history is a venerable category of analysis going back thousands of years. Um, political science is a uh, little bit younger, but well, actually you could argue that even since Aristotle, political science was there. Then there's sociology, and then there's, of course, psychology, and then there's anthropology. And conflict analysis drew itself from all of them. In other words, it saw the value in looking at conflict from multiple lenses. Um, and we keep increasing, as a matter of fact. For example, there's no looking at it without economics and, and without, without looking at power relations. But there's also no looking at it without what uh, one of the gentlemen mentioned of hermeneutics, the science of interpretation and the interpretation of texts. There is discourse analysis. There is analysis of narrative and story where uh, conflict is so conflict is is such a dispute about reality itself and the nature of facts and which facts are true and which facts are fake, etc that people resorted to narrative analysis. So you you study the story of, of, of each person and you gain value from the story itself without judging whether that story is true or false. And then you look at the conflict from that perspective. Um, I, um, I came out of this from philosophy and ethics uh, and, and a comparative religion because my, my PhD and my work was on religions um, and within religions on um, ethical systems uh, and ethical norms, both secular and religious in the history of human thinking. And from that vantage point, I've had a particular form of critique of standard conflict analysis and standard conflict resolution. Conflict resolution is a very different field than conflict analysis. And it, it emphasizes um, problem solving, it emphasizes workshops, it emphasizes many things that have been innovated since the 1980s, dialogue, dialogue workshops. Um, all of these things are interesting and important and they all have aspects of, of, of what I call the broadest term of pro positive social change away from violence or positive social change away from violence is the most generalized possible category here because some people within this field are more pacifistic others are less pacifistic uh, negotiations for example is a close cousin of mediation which is a close cousin of conflict resolution but they are obviously more between states and others that do conduct organized violence that that do justify organized force and so there's a lot of cousins here that and then you have to situate all of that within this this strange thing called reconciliation. And of all of the different categories that we've dealt with, reconciliation has been the hardest to define um, because it is um, it is a term that is heavily laden with ethical background, religious background, spiritual background, and that origin should be studied and should be understood in order to see uh, what reconciliation is doing well, what it may not be doing as well at, and where we stand in terms of, of, of what how reconciliation can be helpful in, in, um, in positive social, what I call positive social change. In particular, in several of my books, in To Make the Earth Whole, I introduced the idea of increments of positive change, or positive increments of change. 
because for many people, especially the origins of all of our field in peace studies and peace studies from the 1960s and 70s, peace studies was very, um, it, it, it was very much about either war or peace. And it was mostly a critique of Western society, capitalist society, uh, and and um, it it counted a lot of bombs. It was about it was about de-escalation of of nuclear war, etc. Didn't have a whole lot to do with the granular. And in what I mean by granular, I mean is the deep, deep relationships that either uh, turn into uh, positive social change or turn into disaster. Uh, there is a there is another part of our field called communications theory. And there are many people who think that, well, it's because people don't know each other well enough. Um, and therefore, most of conflict resolution or peace building or reconciliation is about getting people to know each other. That has been true and not true. The fact is that there are some forms of warfare and some forms of societal conflict where people coming to know each other is not only a beautiful spiritual ideal or an ethical ideal, it turns out to have some practical effects on the course of war. But I am sorry to say that in many parts of the world, intimacy actually seems to breed a uh, terrible conflict, a uh, terrible killing. So there's many, there's been many genocides and many conflicts that come out of intimacy. And we have to face the fact that in, in our field of conflict analysis and resolution, we are very interested not just in, in, in interpersonal peace uh, conflict resolution, we're interested in family conflict and family conflict resolution. Family dynamics, the social psychology of family dynamics, the sociology, and then of course the interpersonal psych, it's very important for us to draw upon the wisdom of our family lives and to face the fact that sometimes intimacy solves many problems and other times they explode because of intimacy. There is less inhibition between husband and wife sometimes and that actually makes the conflicts explode in a way that seems all out of proportion with the kind of, so that they have a love-hate relationship. Well, there are intimates in the world that have a love-hate relationship as well. And and that that reality is is painful because it 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 troubles the people who want simple solutions. People want simple solutions, and therefore they say, "Well, we have to just get we just have to have a dialogue." And it doesn't work that way. I, I remember one dialogue I was in 20, 30 years ago, and it was conducted ridiculously. It was awful. There used to be all sorts of theories of provoking people in dialogues to actually make them argue, you know, to see what the problem was. And it was a catastrophe because the, the, the amount of ways that enemies can hurt each other in with the use of the word is, is limitless. And I remember somebody ending that day saying, thank you for this uh, dialogue workshop. Now I know why I hate them. <laughs> you know, I mean that, you know, so that was like, you know, the opposite of what would have happened. So that's, that's all the, the the different kinds of fields that I come from and that and that great reconciliation studies are related to. And reconciliation is a very um it's a very uh it's such a positive word that for some people in conflict it's it's allergic. It has a negative reaction on people because they say we can never reconcile or we'll never reconcile with them. And and it it actually evokes a a, a strong negative emotion in many people. It certainly did. Uh, I I remember in uh, in in Northern Ireland um, that a close cousin of the concept of reconciliation is the issue of apology and forgiveness, or particularly in forgiveness. And I remember um, in Northern Ireland that I watched. I, you see, I'm a practitioner. I've been a practitioner for 30, 40 years. And then I wrote a lot of books. And then I'm, I am I oversee uh, a center and a PhD program. Um, but I, I, most of my experience has been on the ground. So I, I draw very carefully from what people say. And I was in a room 
and people um one side in the in the protestant catholic conflict somebody said i forgive you and um and started preaching forgiveness and 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 somebody yelled out um cheap grace and it, you have to understand christian tradition to understand that uh, there's an actually a history to the use of that word by prominent Christian theologians on the fact that the grace that comes from uh, from reconciliation with Christ, it has to be earned in a certain way. It has to be modeled. It has to be embodied. And so when somebody says and preaches forgiveness, when people are sitting with all of the horror of what they've been through, they they resent it. And then, and then they 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 redefine it as something called cheap grace. So reconciliation often evokes the opposite. And if for those of you who are going into this and want to write about this and want to promote it, uh, I strongly urge you as a practitioner to be very very cautious about where and when you use this term. That that this can be the intellectual category and the psychological category towards which you aim and towards which your theory building is based upon, but it doesn't mean you have to use that word, okay? You 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 don't have to, a good psychologist, and psychologists are great models here, they will never tell you. I mean, I, I even asked the psychologist, when I said, what? how would you define this illness? And he said, uh, you know, and he just wouldn't answer me because he didn't want to give a label to it because labels tend to reinforce um people become the label it it takes it takes away freedom so for a lot of people the word reconciliation means they've given up they've given up on on revenge for their loved ones on justice for their loved ones and so and so they 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 hate it so it's better not to use the word when people when emotions are very high and you can use all sorts of other interesting words to get to the same goal so from a theoretical point of view, reconciliation is a reality. It is something that happens by the millions of people over history. But it's also, it has to be used very, very carefully in practice. Very carefully. Uh, in uh, I did work in Syria for um, before the war for many years. And Syria is a strong dictatorship. And, uh, and I, um, but I successfully managed to do work across uh, interfaith lines. I always use the, the method of interfaith relations in my work because of my, my background. And um, we had to, in the end, settle not on conflict and not on conflict resolution and certainly not reconciliation. We settled on public relations. And that was our word in Syria for for everything that we do. And it was okay, because if it was okay with the regime to say public relations, we called it public relations, because we got to the same, we got to very deep reconciliations between people, between uh, Alawite and Sunni and Shia and, and Christian uh, and um, city-based and, and rural-based. We did wonderful, wonderful things, but we couldn't call it conflict because According to the regime's representatives, there is no conflict in Syria. Um, and they told they told me so in public. They said, we don't have any conflict in Syria. Uh, that was in 2006. So, you know, you, you also have to deal with censorship. And sometimes words, uh, words are allergic. So that's, uh, that's just in the framing. Um, and I... Um, uh, let me get into some of the, well, let me stop there with, um, I think what I want to do is I want to collect uh, questions and thoughts uh, as we go on, because um, I um, I do well with um, taking your questions and then thinking about them as I'm speaking. So who would like to raise a question? Or not? The questions should be really just under a minute, if possible. Anybody want to um, speak and express a question? Are you used to asking questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are used to ask questions. Okay. So anyone has a question right now? Okay, I, I, I see uh, 
Jack and Bashar. So first Jack and then Bashar. Go ahead, Jack. Thank you, Professor Quickly. It is about your work in, in Syria. How was it? How what was the impact of your work? So what did it end up with? If I, if I may ask. Over yeah. There. Nothing can uh, uh that's <laughs> That's one of the problems with our work is that when you when you have the gall to say that you're going to do reconciliation and you're going to be an authority on reconciliation, you need to get used to the fact that so far we do not have a good relationship with surveys, especially in police states. Uh, you you it's hard to know what the symbolic and viral effect is of very public forms of reconciliation. So, for example. It, we did we did many things on television that involved clerics from Sunni Shia, uh, Protestant, Catholic, um, and uh, Orthodox, uh, all on the same panel, uh, and um, and then women and men together, which was kind of revolutionary for the clerics. So we I don't know how I know I know I know tens of thousands of people saw it. Uh, but you understand that that when we do reconciliation work, we're doing incremental change in individuals, but 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 states and governments have outsized power. So was there an evolution to it? What were we leading to something? Yes, because we uh, the programs got bigger and bigger, and at a certain point before the Arab Spring um, exploded everything. Uh, we were on the verge. We were in the palace. We were actually literally my class from George Mason was studying conflict resolution with uh, Mrs. Assad for two hours. And and we were on the verge of thinking about a curriculum for all of Syria. So, um, you know, and this is where I share with Dr. Iyad a kind of dream that that you stepping aside from uh, wars that are often not preventable um, by by our means that education is the deepest form of social transformation so educational goals we were achieving we were we were in many many homes on television and then we were um in in places of influence that were going to make curriculums and then unfortunately the whole middle east uh blew up with um with democratic revolutionary fervor and then the backlash and you know what happened uh, the 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 hell that was unleashed unleashed in Syria. Um, so um, that was that. Um, I so that was Jack. Who was the next one after Jack? Abdul Razak. No, no, you have okay. to you have, you have to use the the the, the option of reaction and uh, higher your hands. So yes. So ba Bashar was next, and then I'll go to Abdul Razak. Bashar, please. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. I, as I'm Syrian, I'm working about in interreligious dialogue, so I appreciate anything you can share with us more about this issue. Uh, my question is, I uh, is about uh, intimacy. I need to understand more why intimacy could induce more conflict, and how could we discriminate? Uh, between when we could, where, when intimacy could be a part of the solution and where not. Thank you. Yeah, Bashar, it's a it's very very deep question. I you know a lot of my work is is uh, my job in my opinion as an educator is to tantalize you with your own research and your own thinking. So I can't I can't give every last comment on that. I'll just I'll just give teasers. So. Dostoevsky was an amazing Russian, um, you know, there's a lot of people, I'm not going to generalize, uh, but anyways, Russian authors are very good at what's wrong with us. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to say more than that about, about the Russian position in the world today, but uh, Dostoevsky really, really understood murder and he understood the intimacy of it. You see, if you, if you relate it to what goes right and wrong in your own family history, you know that the more you expect from somebody else, from your mother, from your father, from your lover, the more that when they when when it doesn't happen or something really hurtful happens, the more that your reaction can be very explosive. So, um, and also in 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 family, there are complicated power relations where 
where you're supposed to be all siblings, but then one sibling gets more power than the other siblings because of some sort of favor or some reason why the, the parents trust them more than the other siblings, and it explodes. It explodes in very unnatural ways or things that appear to be unnatural. So what I'm arguing by analogy, Bashar, is that is that is that it's not necessarily the case that people when people go to the souk together and they all buy goods from each other and they know each other every day, it doesn't mean that that's going to go well because they all have done business together uh, and even know each other's family. Because if one day out of the blue, they discover that they were cheated or they discover some betrayal, that betrayal is going to hurt them more than somebody who is a perfect stranger. And so intimacy sometimes breeds the opposite. It breeds an explosion of rage uh, because build, people build up resentment over time. And it's actually worse than it was when it's a perfect stranger because you feel hurt in a certain way. But I don't want to leave you with a negative thought. I mean, uh, I haven't mentioned that I my latest books and work and practice is in neuroscience and, and neural pathways. I'm very, very focused on coming back to the human mind and heart. The heart is a metaphor, but other parts of the brain. But um, it just like things can explode from intimacy, also things can reconcile very quick, quickly from intimacy. People I, I have witnessed uh, absolute enemies who passionately love each other and, and sacrifice for each other and risk each other's lives um, for the other in ways they would never do for perfect strangers because they love each other. That also is the unusual effect of intimacy. And I, when I mean intimacy, I mean, uh, I have a whole book called uh, Bridges Across an Impossible Divide. And that book is about pairs of enemies who love each other. And that model of a, um, of a, of a, uh, that, that model of a, a Christian and a Muslim in northern Nigeria, for example, who love each other and sacrifice for each other, but they used to be warriors against each other. That's a model of reconciliation that's extremely powerful. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we have documented many cases from, from Bosnia, from, Pro, from Croat Catholics and Muslims to Muslims and Christians to many others who be, who who developed this intimacy in the middle of war that became a model for what could have come after the war, for a choice for people to make. Sometimes it was through music. Sometimes it was through dialogue. Sometimes it was through praying together. Sometimes it was through taking care of the children together. And that intimacy was also intense. One could argue on some ways that reconciliation, the definition of it is intensity. Is it, it it's an intensity of peace beyond um beyond what would one normally expect uh from uh enemies or former enemies so i i hope that answers some of your question and we'll, we'll we can go further in that abdul razak thank you so much dr Omar. just like one of the the idea that caught my attention when you talked about the experience in in, in the reconciliation is that when you talked about the encounter between the encounter between the two enemies, when they 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 had to come and then they exploited against each other, and then the way you talk about it, the way you talk, and the way you describe it, like it's like it's a kind of with a kind of negativity. It's something negative that we cannot expect. So, uh, and it it didn't get my satisfaction or expectation. So, my question is that: Do we expect, for example, I mean? another scenario is when we have the the two conflicting sides or parties come in i mean calmly they speak to each other with a kind of like in peace i mean because to my mind and that's why uh that why made me like reserved and the way we we talk sometimes on uh reconciliation and then we expect that everything gonna be like going in harmony but in in in, in reality and by logic it cannot because when you bring, when you bring, I mean, two conflict parties, we we cannot expect they, they it's like they will they will be like uh, uh, I mean, uh, brace each other, talk peacefully to each other because they need to explode and they need to encounter, they need to show their their like 
yeah. their, their negative ne negative vibes and so on. Otherwise, we'll not, I mean, do reconciliation because it's a way to to explode, to to get away the, the, the negative energy and to get another one. I mean, to open doors for another one. I mean, positive vibes. I mean, that we can build on the future processes. Okay, so this is a... This is a very deep topic, and I'll get I'll come to Dr. Iyad next because uh, he might have to leave soon. Um, it, it, this is a very deep topic, and in, and I've thought about it for many many years, and I've written about it. Here's the thing: it, the the neuroscience we know now is that the neural pathways of positive feelings, positive affect, it's called technically, positive compassion, are critical for positive social change and, and less violence. It's absolutely essential that people get used to the, the habits of, 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 um, of, of honor, dignity, respect, appreciation. There's a whole field of psychology, positive psychology called appreciative inquiry. It's very, very healthy for you. And many, many people, it, Marty Seligman is one of the most famous experts in depression in the West. Uh, for the last 40 years, pioneered so much of the research. And he himself says, I became depressed. And the reason is because when you, all you think about is depression, you become depressed. When all you think about is happiness, it doesn't mean you won't get depressed, but it means that you'll be moving your brain and your mind towards a goal of happiness, flourishing, meaningfulness, fulfillment, following Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and so on. So that positive psychological goal is scientifically proven now to be a better way to conduct dialogues. However, and this is where the compromise is, also I'm doing a lot of research now on futurism, on prospection, and on the part of our brain that thinks about the future. The moment people argue about policy and the future, they are less enraged and they are more creative and they're more imaginative and they actually find compromises. Whereas when you think about the pain of the past and the losses, it only leads to, to explosion and to uh, a, a deep feeling that we can never give up. And that's when you get into cycles of revenge being inescapable. So, uh, so Abdul Razak, you're absolutely right that anybody who creates a reconciliation therapy or conflict resolution process that doesn't allow for negative feelings, that will fail. If there is no space in your processes of relationship building for anger and explosion, then it will fail. But if all you want to talk about is the anger, it will also fail. Okay, is is that if you if you only focus on what people are angry about, it fails even worse. But if you have a goal towards where do we want to be in five years from now, you ask your brain, where do you want to be? How do you want to live? How do you want your grandchildren to be able to be happy and live a long, prosperous life together with their neighbors? You, you're, the brain changes immediately to a different kind of calculus that focuses on millions of years of the brain calculating possible futures. That doesn't mean that when you get to that and somebody has two different views of the future, two different entities, or an entity where all people are Muslim or all people are Christian or all people are liberal academics, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna argue. But if they argue from the point of view of the future and how we're gonna get along, it moves more towards principles, towards shared principles. And that's the higher part of the brain. And it also moves towards a compassionate understanding of the other. Uh, so all I'm saying is that this is a little bit of a shift of emphasis, but yes, you're absolutely right that anybody who tries to control the relationship and say no anger, you know, don't, don't ever, don't explode. I don't wanna hear what you have to say. No, that's a big mistake. You just have to figure out the processes of how to manage that anger. Like, 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 for example, would it, you know, would you, um, would you take a break and sit and really listen to somebody? Absolutely. Would you find flexibility in a program to deal with, with anger management um, and, and hearing people's stories? Absolutely. So all of that is, 
all of that is very, very good, and I'm glad you raised it. Uh, Dr. Iyad, I want to skip to you because um, because of your time constraints. Go ahead. Yeah, I will try to stay as long as I can. It depends on the guy when he when I will uh, he will. Travel. I know. So um, I wanted to ask you. I read your article about uh, uh, empathy and compassionate reasoning, and you said that compassionate reasoning has travels vertical, and empathy travels horizontal. Maybe you can give us just uh, exactly how how it goes vertical, the compassion reasoning, how it transforms vertically, and how empathy goes horizontal. So they are not are they really interacting with each other or not? Yeah, I don't remember saying that compassionate was vertical and empathy was horizontal. If I did, I'm not sure what I meant. Uh, but let me let me just define for everyone else the science of this. The sci there is science now on the difference between empathy and compassion, um, and 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 the scientists, the neuroscientists, call it empathic distress. So um, empathic distress is a very important thing to understand for why so many people uh, burn out in our field, why so many people turn back to violence even after having great empathy. It turns out that empathy is a very specific pathway of the brain, and it also causes very specific metabolic responses of great distress. It increases cortisol. When you feel bad for someone else's pain, and you fail bad for five people's brain, and then in five million people's um, uh, pain, it causes overwhelming stress to the brain and to the meta metabolism of the body. And that the, the exhaustion we know from science turns people towards their violent side. So if the amygdala is in the brainstem and, and, and the amygdala is about fighting people or avoiding people and running away from people or being antisocial or saying antisocial things, doing antisocial things, all of that comes from empathy. It actually, we actually have a world in which many people are violent towards each other because they have too much empathy for the pain of people in their family on or in their side. Compassion is a completely different emotion. And this is the emotion that all some of the greatest wisdom traditions in history, uh, from Tibetan Buddhism to um, to the Bible, uh, many many places make the compassion. And compassion is defined not as feeling bad for others. It's a different neural pathway. We see it on the MRIs. It's a pathway of love and care and service. It's when you feel so happy to be able to help somebody else. And that is lowers cortisol, it lowers cholesterol, it lowers your metabolism, and it's highly sustainable, and it creates, um, it's very future-oriented. I can't, I can't wait to get up to, um, to take care of those kids again today. I can't wait to get to uh I just get off on 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 giving a meal to homeless people. I just love it. I can't wait to find somebody on the street. As opposed to I can't wait to get up and see how many people have died today and been murdered. Who says that? Nobody wants to get up to read that. So it's avoidance and it gets worse and worse over time the more that you're exposed to warfare either personally or virtually. Empathic distress can destroy you on virtual. This has been proven. Whereas compassion um, can heal you, it can save you. So when I say vertical and horizontal, all I'm trying to say, Ayad, is that, is that uh, some things are viral, which is more like horizontal, and some things are vertical in the sense that the, the, uh, they can affect people um, at various levels of power and influence. And I think that compassion can be taught in the schools, but it also can be related. I, I've actually, uh, you know, a, a number of us try to consult with militaries and police because we earnestly believe that the more that people are trained in compassion and reasoning and moral reasoning at high levels of military and police, the better decisions they will make that will be the most compassionate possible decisions. I know chiefs of police. I'll give an example, and then I'll go to the next person. 
wonderful, amazing chief of police that I worked with in, in Boston from a small town. Um, he was on patrol as a, an officer and he was ordered by his chief of police, you don't relate to anybody. Don't go in, don't get friendly with the shopkeepers. You're there to intimidate them. See, that's one model of policing, right? Very top down. The other one is that you get to know everybody, which is community policing, right? So he comes into this apartment and this guy has got a knife and he's got his 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 his, uh, his spouse. And really, when somebody has a knife in their hand in American policing, you do have permission to shoot them. You know, you're a cop. You're right there. And the knife can kill somebody in a second. You shoot. And he made a choice to not shoot and to ask the guy a simple question. He said, how can we both go home today to our families? How can we both go home today to our families? So you see that in five words, he triggered the man's mind to the future and to the compassionate engagement of that person's destiny. And he tied it to his own destiny. How can we both go home to our families today? Do you see what that does to the brain rather than him saying, you jerk, I'm going to shoot you in a second if you don't put that damn knife down and screaming at him, right? And that would be, you know, that would trigger something entirely different in the brain. It would trigger shame. It would trigger defensiveness. It would figure, trigger fight or flight. And in a second, the guy would be dead, right? So you see how every word matters in terms of whether we trigger compassion and the future or rage and empathy and the past. That's that's my that's what so I'm compassion trying. Compassion is practice. More compassion is practice and empathy is powerlessness. Mm. Empathy is sure. powerlessness, mm -hmm. and, and that's why people get so enraged by it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's let's go to uh, Jean Marie. You're, You're still muted. Mute. You're still muted. Okay. Oh. Okay. My question is that uh, how reconciliation how reconciliation can be together with uh, justice? Because sometimes uh, we see uh, where there is reconciliation, there are some people who get um, amnesty, others who don't really punish. Uh, there's no really some time re uh, reparation. So how really uh, uh, reconciliation can be together with justice? Okay, so uh, this is great. You're all you're anticipating all the things that I was going to talk about um, in the second hour, but we can go out of order because the way you frame the question is more important than my outline. <laughs> so uh, so here's 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 what I'm thinking. And it, this is a very deep question that we don't have simple answers to, uh, but we all have to be very open to the problem of reconciliation and justice. And so in the article that we asked you to read today, um, I'm making the case that reconciliation is more effective and more efficacious and more valid to the degree to which it's, it's individual and person to person and based on opportunity on when it occurs to people to want to engage in reconciliation. I don't think it should interfere with justice processes. So for example, I don't believe this is radical and I, you know, people can disagree with me. I have tended not to feel that there should be truth and reconciliation commissions for national crimes and national tragedies. I tend to feel there should be truth commissions and to do it to the degree to which the truth can be established, which is hard enough to get multiple truths on the table, there are implications from those truths that can lead to either justice, criminal investigation, or compromise or reconciliation. But I wouldn't have a commission in charge of my need for reconciliation because it takes away my power to, uh, to push for my just for justice. Okay, truth 
does not take away from my power to argue for justice. But reconciliation does take away from my power to look for justice. And I would not want that imposed. So there are two radically different literatures in reconciliation. One of those literatures focuses on individual reconciliation, on an imam and a pastor in Nigeria or a, a, a priest in Sarajevo who unites with people of other religions to embrace um, a choir and singing in the middle of war to stop the killing and to prevent the killing, and that as a form of reconciliation even in the middle of war or in Nigeria, even in the middle of the civil conflicts all over the country between Muslims and Christians, for an imam and pastor to model what it is to care for each other, to, to, um, to take care of each other's families and communities, right? So that doesn't interfere with justice, because those people are trying to teach a different way that they have chosen for themselves. But if Nigeria as a country said, okay, we're all reconciled now, go home, then that contradicts justice because millions of people have not been heard. So I believe in national truth commissions. I don't believe in truth and reconciliation commissions, even though I have great respect for Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela, and I understand why they wanted to prevent a civil war. And, and I, maybe I would have done the same thing in their shoes. But I think we have to be very careful here with practical reality versus ideal. Ideally, I would like to see truth commissions everywhere. And then from those truth commissions, more relationships could be built of reconciliation. Because victims want to be heard. They want the truth to be told about what they went through. There's not really, you know, it, many, many people who are, I, I know, I know millions of victims in my lifetime, they don't always want to reconcile with their enemies, but they want the truth to be told and it calms them down. It gives them some peace and it makes them less violent. So truth is a very interesting thing. Sometimes it can go with reconciliation, but it should never, ever be forced. That's that's my my solution to what you're you know you're you're uh, saying um, Matthew and then Laura. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you for this exposition. While you were talking, you about reconciliation. You mentioned about a provocative reconciliation where the two party comes together and to dialogue, and then there is a provocative mechanism so as to prevent the two parties from um, reconciling through dialogue. And I, was, and I was concerned about the last statement that you said, that um, somebody gave after the old scenario of the dialogue and how it ended. I have believed and read over time, especially as said by um, the Pope, that the best form of reconciliation is dialogue and what the two parties should bring to the table is kindness. That means considering um, and then accepting to dialogue out what has happened over time, which is going to help in the process of reconciliation and conflict resolution. Now, I want to ask, is there any other things to look out for in dialogue of sorts when provocation is about to be triggered, introduced, so as to avoid a very smooth and easy reconciliation? Is there anything one can do to prevent provocation, to prevent anger, and to have a smooth dialogue within these parties so as to come to a very nice table of resolution of whatever conflict that is on ground? Okay, Thank excellent, you. excellent questions. Here we also have to enter into cultural analysis. I think it was uh, Haifa or uh, somebody plus Haifa who um, were very concerned that there would be no space for anger. Um, in, in this dialogic process. And I have to say that we really also have to study the other anthropology and culture and religion are very important here as well. And that is that we just, we really have to feel each situation differently. There are people who, if they don't have a chance to be angry, cannot engage in conflict resolution and peace building. 
But there are other parts of the world where there's anger erupts in the meeting and they actually can end up killing each other. So anger is very dangerous. It's very explosive. It's very hypnotic. So everybody has a moral responsibility to judge in their situation what is the best path to less violence and more compassion and 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 more truth telling. I uh, uh, I I think you just mentioned the Pope, but um, I certainly I think the science is there with kindness as the core, but I, I honestly have written a lot about critiquing dialogue. I have been critical of dialogue because dialogue is only one form of conflict resolution on a global setting. In many settings, um, peace building is behind the scenes. It's shuttle diplomacy. In the Middle East, there's something called a uh, sulha, and sulha or sulh is also paralleled in all the great traditions coming out of the Middle East. And it is not. It ends up in a kind of formal dialogue, but there's many other things, many there's dawa, there's 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 um there's compensation, there is compensation for damages. There's many other things to consider in terms of the honor and dishonor that comes about from crime before you assume that dialogue is just the best solution. Dialogue often creates a worse situation. The other problem is that dialogue um, privileges people who are good with words, who are slick with words. And the, and the problem is, is that many, many people, there is gender differences here too, many people are terrible with words but they're very good with actions. So you want to make a space in reconciliation for both a word, word driven reconciliation and action driven reconciliation, symbol driven reconciliation, the power of moral deeds, the power of care, the power of compassion, which is not the same as the power of saying the right words at the right time. Many, many people in conflict don't believe words that they hear from the other side. They need to see action. They need to see evidence. And they need to see many instances of that before they start to change, because the brain doesn't change on a dime. So there are many reasons why um, um, I, I, I am much more focused on compassion and, and, and morally based uh, deeds that people do for each other. Uh, and future orientation than I am on the dialogue, the, the moment of dialogue, which is very, very tricky. And and very often it's actually led to some, some worse problems. Um, Laura. So Professor Liner in this instance will ask a question. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor Gopin. The beam is us and it's always very inspiring what you are saying. Um, one thing you, you said, uh, you probably know that I'm thinking differently. That is about not to separate reconciliation from justice and truth. And um, I would like uh, to ask you a question. Um, when you have people discussing about justice, um, they have often different uh, justice claims. And um, those justice claims somehow, if you are oriented towards the future, they need somehow to be brought together or reconciled or how do you manage to to move forward because people tend to repeat their i am yes. the right to do this mm -hmm. and this land is my land and this right. is and this must be punished and this and so on and where is the force to move uh, move on uh, and to to get a common future mm -hmm. yes and, absolutely so so Here's what I would argue. And um, first of all, advocacy is a moral act. When you advocate for somebody and you advocate for the justice of their position, that in my, if you advocate for everyone equally, a classic Kantian you know, commitment to advocating for everyone's human rights, no matter who they are, then that to me is a, a moral norm that is legitimate and important and a very important altruistic behavior of the human human community. I just don't, I just think that it should be treated closer to truth and the search for truth 
than the search for reconciliation. Because in my experience, many people who reconcile have, have never agreed on the truth and have never agreed on justice. They live with the tension that they know they will never achieve the justice that they want. You know, many, uh, you know, my, it's just amazing to me, like, for example, um, in the Jewish community, uh, by the millions in the last 50 years, there's been a remarkable level of, of for lack of a better word, um, normal relations with German people that that imply the opposite of collective responsibility and collective judgment. The collective judgment was left behind. Um, and what they what they seemed to demand and need was was the whole truth. And when that whole truth was acknowledged, then then that that advocacy and justice side was satisfied. And then there was the possibility of new relationship. I don't know whether to call that reconciliation or not, because for some people it is reconciliation. For other people, it will it, it never it, it will never be that. So it's a very complicated topic. And my estimation is that you can have moral norms that go after justice and that go after truth and that go after reconciliation. And reconciliation sometimes is never achieved, but but um but it adds something that that makes violence less possible, that makes a new future more possible. So I just I, I I've just seen evidence of reconciliation without justice. And I've seen evidence of justice without reconciliation. And so as a philosopher, I want to acknowledge the reality of that. And to, as a peace builder, to say, okay, you're all welcome into the tent of the future. Some of you will reconcile and won't, you know, there's never, there was, it's not about collective guilt of, of German people, for example. It's about the fact that there may have been at least 50,000 criminals who committed mass murder in, in the Holocaust, 50,000. Justice could have demanded a life sentence or death for 50,000 people. And they, it's impossible. And so they, they gave up on that justice, just like uh, many other genocides I've studied, where people give up on the fact that, you know, their teacher across the road helped with the genocide. And, and they, they're never going to get them in jail. But at least they'll have the leaders in jail and they'll be acknowledged for what happened to them. So in Cambodia, Bosnia, everywhere you go, there's no complete justice. So what are we supposed to do with that in terms of, of reconciliation? That That's where I'm, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but what do you think? Why don't you respond? I, I now feel in your answers that we have probably a bit different uh, uh, definition also for reconciliation. For me, it's reconciliation, the creation of of better relationships after grave incidents. And it's practically an ongoing journey. There are some moments where you can say, yeah, there is a closure of something and a new step reached, but it's uh, always ongoing. And so um, I think you, if you have the truth already, uh, that uh, people have the courage to, to share, for example, the truth, um, there is already a certain reconciliation in the same moment active that yeah. people have a better yeah. reason because they, they respect the other person as somebody you, which uh, deserves the truth and we mm -hmm. had uh, and more which has or even a right to hear the hear the truth and so so I think it will always go on right processes and. Uh, I, uh, I I do think there's something called philosophical conflict resolution, which we haven't even invented yet, that involves definition of terms, because yeah. I think I think that we in philosophy understand that so many conflicts or or miscommunications come about that we're defining our terms completely differently in the same conversation. So part of the reconciliation process would be shared definitions of terms that we can agree on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to get to Abdul Razak, and uh, we're at, uh, wow, we have to take a break soon. So after Abdul Razak, let's take a break. 
it, it just like you have just mentioned the, the, the problem that I wanted to mention, which is like related to the idea of term terminology, because the terminology, if we have, let's say, unified terminology to talk about the same topic, it could be it could fix the problem. It could fix the problem. It could, let's say, pave the way for uh, avoidance of the problem, because when we talk, when we when I read about the reconciliation and then the way I mean scholars and uh, reconciliation practitioner talk about it, it's like it's it seems to me I'm talking I'm I'm reading about a lot of things which is different, one different from another, and the problem lies in the I mean uh, I mean till now we we don't have a unified terminology to describe I mean I mean uh, reconciliation I mean specifically at the level of the processes because because uh, when i read your article it's like a lot of uh, i mean there is a complexity in terms of the i mean the process many processes that can be like united to uh, together and then like i'm going to give you example and then uh, and, and this way i'm i'm asking about why for example we have uh, different i mean uh, terminology that can be like brought together uh, it's like because when we're talking about reparation, reparation, what I'm talking, I'm referring to trial, punishment, and restoration, and so on. When I'm talking about forgiveness, it seems to me, it's like it seems to me that I'm talking about amnesty, and uh, this is like, I mean, uh, and 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 in, in this way, if we cannot, like, I mean, it's like a kind of narrowing, narrowing, I mean having the less minimum uh, concepts to talk about the same, because to guarantee that we are talking about or researching about the same, I mean, right. concepts or, yeah. Right, Thank exactly. Yeah. And I, yeah. so I, I wrote about 70 pages on forgiveness, a critique of forgiveness in my book, Holy War, Holy Peace, on religion and peace in the Middle East. That's one of my earlier books. And I, I I just really launched into forgive forgiveness is a good example of where you have to come to a definition of terms that you share in the conversation, because from a cultural point of view and from a religious point of view, philosophical point of view, people are all over the map on what they mean by the word forgiveness. For many people, it's important to their religion that forgiveness is a reality. It's at the center of their religion. For other people, it's not important in their religion at all. I can't find too many Buddhist sources on forgiveness, but 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 I I can I can find Islamic and Jewish sources on forgiveness, but it's of a very particular nature. It has to have repentance. It has to have reparations. It has to have confession. It has to have a commitment to change in the future. You know, all of these things that are not what somebody thinks of as just religious forgiveness. I just forgive you. They 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 wouldn't they wouldn't do what the pope did. The pope did a very complicated thing. He forgave his killer, his assassin, but then he kept him in jail at the same time. So that was a specific catholic spiritual thing that he did. And we have to respect that. So the question is if we wanted it, it, you know, this is a hard topic, uh, Abdul Razak, but I, I've never seen a good program on forgiveness. I've seen good actions on people who become, who build a relationship together where they forgave each other uh, because they were, they had been warriors and now they're peacemakers. I've seen that in action. We have to respect that and learn from it. And there's a model there for former warriors. I've seen American and Vietnamese generals. I've seen many former warriors who actually work together. So there's a kind of forgiveness there and an understanding of a fellow warrior who killed and now is against the killing. That's a beautiful model of forgiveness, but it has to be individual to those people. When you start imposing it, I had a man who wanted me to forgive him on his deathbed. He was dying of cancer, and he put me in a terrible position in front of, you know, 40, 50 Europeans, and he and he's dying of cancer, and the German people there were very embarrassed by it, but he he's, he's dying of cancer, and then he says, I was only 15, and I was part of the Waffen-SS, and I'm asking you for forgiveness right now, you know, 
and it was in public. It was terrible. I'll tell you why. It violated every one of my principles. I can't forgive him for what he did to somebody else. That that's for him to, you know, in my culture, if you if the person is dead, at least you should go to their grave and beg forgiveness. But but I can't I I it's immoral for me to forgive him for what he did to somebody else. It's it's unethical. So we really have to, you know, and then and then the amazing thing is that that one of the German people who was there, who became close friends, they um they gave me a gift. And they didn't quite say what the gift was, but it was a beautiful piece of silver that was in the family uh for generations. And and <laughs> They were doing penance. You know what penance is? They were doing uh, repentance because their father and that family had been part of the broadcasting of Nazi literature that helped to steal everything from the Jewish community. So they were giving me back one of the last family heirlooms that they had as a symbolic a, a, a kind of repentance. See, see, that I understood. That was powerful because it made sense in my culture and it made sense for them too. So there has to be a mutuality in reconciliation. It has to be a process that comes to reconciliation that both parties really feel, and then it can be transformative to new relationship. If it's imposed by anybody, it doesn't work. If it's, if it's forced, it doesn't work. But when it comes from both, it's like, a revelation. It's like a transformation. It's it's almost miraculous. Okay, so I think that we should uh, take a break, and then we have, what time should we come back, Iyad? Uh, I think five minutes, and then uh, maximum ten. five is, is, is enough, because we started at 2.10, and then we can continue until four. Okay, so we'll, okay, good. So we'll see you all in five minutes. Five minutes is good, thank you. And Nora, we'll get to you, Nora.
Do you see all of the things <laughs> behind me? Yes. <clears throat> I'm trying to see it. Okay. Ah, oh, good. What you need I made it to, you need to switch them. The faces. You need to switch the faces to, to, to us. So these are Aristotle, the big face is Aristotle. And then you have Karl Marx, and then you have Everos, and then you have uh, a, a, a one from Patra University, a prize from Patra, and one from Dubai, Abu Dhabi, for research. So it's your 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 field, Professor. Aristotle is, is behind you, is in front, uh, behind uh, uh, Rawan. <laughs> he's, he's one of my heroes, that's for sure. Yeah, as well, <laughs> as well, mine as well, yeah, and as well, Professor Zliner. <laughs> he, right. he, he went to, I went to buy to buy it, and then I found we both found it in a place in a museum for sale, so we didn't buy it. So we went back, so I decided to go back to buy it. So I went back to buy it, I didn't find it. Guess why? Because Martin went back to buy it first. Yeah. <laughs> so I went back to the car. I told him I went back to buy it, and he's like, "Here it is." <laughs> That's that was... very funny. Yeah, it's so very hilarious. Very funny. We don't know where he is. He was here online. I maybe yes. he wanted to drink coffee or something. He was. So the we one... can continue. What do you he think? Was sitting... you continue, he was actually. sitting. Yes, let's continue, uh, and let's start with uh, Nora's question. Hi, Professor. Um, I was really reflecting on what you said about justice and reconciliation and, and a path and what to do or what, how to proceed with some kind of a solution oriented, future oriented um, process, given that justice may not be possible. And actually, within our community, I'm here in Palestine and in our communities of, you know, um, Coexistence actors, shared society people, people working together across borders here between Palestinians and Israelis. We are asking this question because we're realizing, I think, this time around, that there are acknowledgments that are never going to come, that there are some kind of um, acknowledgement of something that either side wants from the other that is simply never going to come. And we're reckoning now with what, what, what does that mean? You know, how, how do we move forward as in some kind of partnership in recognition of the fact that the future has to be built together, that there isn't going to be any options without working together in some way, whether we like it or not. Um, and and we, we like it to various degrees across time. But what do we do about the fact that maybe for some people, there is some Kind of acknowledgement of who Hamas is that some of us are willing to give and some of us are not willing to give and some people wishing for a specific perspective on October 7th that is or is not forthcoming and some people wishing for a kind of acknowledgement about the Nakba or other things that may or may not be forthcoming and how do we move forward with that understanding that justice or acknowledgement or you know requests for forgiveness may never come and it's really hard. It's I think we're in a moment here in, in, in our in my communities of sort of peace builders and anti-occupation people where we're trying to reckon with with not knowing what to do. It really for us really highlighted this that there's a divide even between us and we are the minority of people who are trying to work across borders. Right. Um and let one me, question, let me, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. Please Is there go ahead. This, one one last question that we're trying to sort of ask each other in this time is to say, if I, if this was healed in me, if this need was no longer in me, what would I be willing to give, right? If I no longer needed an acknowledgement for this, or if this wound had been healed, was already healed in me, then what could I give? Because it seems to sort of, you know, try to get us around the stuckness around acknowledge me and my pain and my history first, and then I can. Right. Um, well, let me let me just say that uh, again. Uh, you know, uh, 
Iyad and and Martin and I both have this love for for um, for Aristotle, and it's for me it's not just Aristotle, it's Immanuel Kant. Once he acknowledged the the bads in a, in, in a European empires in the 1790s, it's also the prophet Ezekiel who was uh, pretty misogynist, but it, he was not did not have a good attitude to women, but he was very very. He was one of the first prophets in history to um, argue for individual responsibility and no more. He argued against collective punishment, collective responsibility. He said each person should only be guilty of their own crimes, no one else's. And if you think about it, that's one of the most powerful ways to stop cycles of revenge, cycles of hate, and cycles of responsibility between people. The reason I'm mentioning that, Nora, is that there's also another thing in psychology called uh, good enough. And good enough is a very important issue of mental health. There is certainly a lot of great things about flourishing and meaningfulness, but it's also good enough if you're not hurting yourself. It's good enough if you're a little bit miserable any day, every day, but you've stopped abusing yourself. And so the way I analogize that to our situation is that everybody's trying to grab on to too much. It, it would be good enough if Palestinians ignored Israelis and just focused on reconciliation among themselves, on what are their shared values, their shared principles, and, and moving forward with that, that by nature would undercut the extremisms, but also the hatreds that have come onto them. And so many times people ignore the low hanging fruit of interpersonal reconciliation and building relationships incrementally that hold each person responsible for just their actions and then building a future together with that agreement. So whether it's Aristotelian ethics or Kantian ethics or the prophet Ezekiel, the idea is that you build one step at a time. So you never agree on some of the bigger issues about, but, but as people become less violent and hateful and abusive of each other, and they start to develop much more common values, and then it gives them more power, actually, moral power in the world. And that moral power leads to better negotiation positions. And it's the same in, uh, you know, if there's, if people feel that they're being oppressed by a larger force, that larger force is only strengthened when they are divided, when they hate each other. And as a matter of fact, um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of your conflict because it, it, it's very emotional right now for all of us, but I can tell you that you know, there's such woundedness on the other side from what they've gone through, but they have very tactically learned from all of their experience how to keep people divided who they are afraid of. I mean, there was a time in the 50s when the, the whole strategy was that each village, each muhtar, was kept in a different box by controlling forces in order to keep Palestinians divided between all the different regions and factions. So in some ways, everyone's going to benefit by incremental reconciliation, by incremental processes of acknowledgement of differences, and then building and agreeing to disagree on some of the bigger ones. And I, and I think on the other side, this is desperately important as well because they're they're on the verge of a civil war. People don't realize it. So cynical people can think, oh, a civil war will be great. Then we'll get back Palestine. No, that, that's exactly when there could be mass killing. So the best thing is for both of these communities to start to reconcile in incremental ways that don't satisfy all justice, but build relationships across especially gender lines, and across secular religious lines, across class lines, so that people build community together um, in a way that makes it harder for people to divide them 
and then for the possibility of larger peace and justice to come about, in my opinion. And that's what I recommend for both. That's why uh, I'm not going to speak for Iyad, but we're very, we, we're we're almost like, um, we're reconciliation, con con we're reconciliation conspirers. We're trying to insinuate the psychology of reconciliation into everyone, because in the aggregate, it will make the larger conflicts less violent, less extreme, and more subject to uh, to peace and justice. That's that's we've and we've seen it. I, I've seen it happen in many other places. Is that over time, that that habit starts to create the uh, new possibilities. I we it, it, there was a lot of work in the 1950s that went into the fact that today a French German war is inconceivable for the first time in a thousand years. A thousand years of French German warfare. Hundreds and hundreds of years of French English warfare. Why is it inconceivable now? Because business relationships, personal relationships, intermarriage, many, many things, economic benefits, many, many things, reading each other's literatures and so on, many things went into why it's inconceivable now. So we have to think in terms of centuries. And a lot of that is incremental reconciliations of individuals. I, I was witness to that in, in Europe. Uh, uh, the stories that we have of reconciliation from the 1950s were individual French and Germans that went through this process. And now it seems obvious, but it wasn't obvious at all. It could have been continuation. So we have to have to think in the long term. Uh, Ro Rowan. Well, Ro uh, yeah, please go can ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. So yes. first you said uh, Palestinians should ignore Israel and focus on their internal cleavages. So if I may say, you're literally saying that Israel can keep provoking Palestinians by further annexation, assassinations, settler attacks, collective punishment, which is kind of for me against your preaching for compassion, where I understand compassion in your um, in writings that's more of feeling the others and, and literally acting on elevating the suffering. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean that at all. I actually assumed that um, because um, because uh, 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 Nora had had been raising issues of people agreeing on larger processes of reconciliation, and I'm saying that that that's not possible at this point, precisely for that reason. In other words, people are going to continue to struggle the way that they believe in struggling. And, and some are going to struggle nonviolently, others are going to struggle violently, and or they're going to agree with violence, and others are going to not going to agree with violence. And I'm not, I'm not commenting on on people have a right to struggle, people have a right to defend themselves. That's a universal human right. And unfortunately, in conflicts, both sides see that they have that right, which means the conflict, the the violent conflict, continues. All I'm suggesting is that among themselves that greater reconciliations and greater teaching of reconciliation and understanding of what it is for religious and secular to live it together to live together with different different a uh, different re gender relationships um different economic levels um uh, not demonizing each other all of these prepare the ground for a more rational approach to resisting oppression together yeah, if I may, Professor, uh, he's trying. I, I, yeah, to... please go ahead. Yeah, that reconciliation is a process, and it transforms the reality into new reality, and it does not come as an end. So you cannot say like uh, reconciliation is not going to happen. It never happens. You incrementally, as Professor Mark is saying, it's incremental happens. Like if you go the, the for the Irish case, for example, they didn't do reconciliation. It's a process, and the process goes step by step. You do this, I do this for the benefit of both of us. And it can lead back to one person, inner group, outer group, or internationally. So you cannot say like, oh, reconciliation is not going to happen because we are all hating each other, of course, because it needs, uh, we can say baby steps maybe, or incremental. It's a process. 
like uh, like as uh, we right. said it's a process you need to build it up it does not come trust for example you have an enemy you are in fight and conflict for many years this will not happen that tomorrow morning you're gonna wake up and say oh wow, i love him and i trust him no there should be mutual understanding to develop shared common values and this takes time and it takes a process to build so i can tell you for example the irish case today irish don't like each other the North and the South who are part of Britain, they hate each other until today and they are willing to kill each other. But the problem is that the reality of reconciliation has changed them. So now they are more, uh, they are prosperous, they're pursuing happiness and they don't want to go back to the old days. IRA will not go back to bombing in, in London because they got what they want. No, they didn't get what they want, but they were working on working on it. You don't get it. We don't get what you want. You work on developing a better future. And this, like, as you go to school first, you go to kindergarten, and then you go to school, senior school, you go to university. This is the process of reconciliation. Incrementally, it happens. It never happens in, 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 a, in, a, in a long, in one shot. The, and, uh, the other the the other thing is that there are people always ready to divide you when you leave these things un, un you know unhealed. Uh, so for example, there are east this East German West German tension still, and there's plenty of people on the outside in in Russian intelligence that are working real hard to turn Germans against each other, to turn Finns against each other, to turn Baltic against each other, and there's a lot of money that goes into that. And so if Germans don't keep working on German relationships, they will be divided. They will be weakened by that. So I'm saying the same thing about the Palestinian case. And I'm saying that on the one hand, you know, in my personal experience, I, I worked there for 40 years. There's a large, large group of people who, who don't know what to do with their neighbors on the other side. But as long as those neighbors are divided, they don't trust them at all because they don't know which faction is going to gain the upper hand if they ever give up anything. Whereas um, there are others, smaller group, but very dangerous, who are thrilled that Palestinians are divided, and they've actively worked at building up um, extremists and weakening national figures in order to keep them divided. So this is, this is, a, a, this is not just pie in the sky <laughs> pie in the sky reconciliation this is tactical and strategic and ethical reasons to make reconciliation into an incremental process between gender because gender is at the core of many extremist movements you know gender treatment uh gender uh money you know rich and poor secular and religious I was right in the thick of this in the 1980s, and I have to tell you, and I was right at the highest levels, I'm not going to say who, in Ramallah and other places, and I can tell you that the biggest tragedy was that secular Palestinians and secular Israelis wanted to crush religious people, period, to put them out of existence. And they said it, and they lost all of those potential partners for coexistence. And so there's many other fissures here that 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 outsiders will always capitalize on. And and uh, we we need to build each community stronger so that they can more rationally negotiate a future with strength. That's that's the idea. Um, Mohammed Abdurrahman. Yes, thank you Prof, for your interesting presentation. Uh, let me share my experience. Uh, according to my work uh, now with the uh, conflicted families i think before we start the, the the reconciliation process we should prepare all the two parts because the two parts were traumatized and in, based on my experience with the conflicted family here in qatar before we start uh, reconciliation we we do individual session with uh, you know, separately with, with them we find them um, traumatized and they perceive the other person in a different way, in a negative way. First of all, we do like healing process, like we release anger and negative emotions, let them release that. And then after that, we work on the positive emotions, 
how do you perceive the other person? What are the shared experience, positive experience? And tell me about negative, uh, positive emotions about them. And then after preparation, this preparation, and we make sure that all of them were partially healed from the, the, the trauma, we start to uh, prepare them for sitting to get together. When they sit together, uh, I, I mean about, about uh, these uh, conflicted families, then we start to talk about reconciliation process and how can we share common future. So many cases we managed in so many cases that they became, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the return back to their normal marital status again, and the family format reform it again. So I think, I think in order to you know, succeed in reconciliation process, we need to start healing uh, them individually and then uh, work on the collective emotions in the positive side. Am I right, or you have? Uh, no, I know. I think uh, I think it's excellent. And if I had if I had my way to repeat my life, I would do it more that way than what I did. Because what I did was I found individual Palestinians and Israelis who really loved each other and did all of this great symbolic work together, and they were way too ahead too ahead of each of their communities. I didn't prepare those communities. I just made this wonderful model of this you know rabbi and imam and they did wonderful work and they were so deep and they helped each other but it was too much because what really was necessary was much deeper work on the trauma of each people and a compassionate way to help them to heal and be ready for the kind of negotiations that really uh, never took place not the deeper ones not the ones people to people that never took place. So I love what you're saying about the family model and the courts. This is exactly the kind of analogies we look for in the process of human wisdom. Uh, and that's what Aristotle would have loved too. You start with the individual psyche, you go to the interpersonal, you go to the communal, and then you go to political science. And you think in the much larger ways of, of what conflict, what, what, what it is to you really flourish as a human community. Um, we're out of time. Uh, it's already, it's already, uh, whatever it is for you for, yeah, yeah um, we're out of, we're out of time. We, we thank you so much, professor, for this is a good enlightenment uh, of the lecture. Yeah, I want to, I want to recommend to you that I, 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 um, I have an eight step process that's very practical and very focused on the emotions and the mind. And I highly recommend it's used by thousands of people I've actually worked with many Syrian refugee women uh, uh, all over um, uh, the exile uh, in Jordan. And, and uh, these methods work. So think about taking all the sophisticated stuff you're doing as PhDs and as graduates and in educated circles and translating them into very accessible forms of reconciliation. That's the most important thing we can do as well. We can't stay way up here. We have to bring this into things that can be translated uh, for average people so that average people are not captured. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, a lot of educated people don't know how to handle their emotions know, either. Okay. So you know, it's no, just, no. you know, oh, yeah. it's very, very important to translate these things into yeah, something that's emotionally acceptable to everyone. So what okay. I will do is I will put the, your um, Healing the Heart of Conflict. I'll put the mm -hmm. reference here, Professor Gopin, so everybody can make sure to look at that. Okay. And the one thing I didn't get to, but we can we talk go. about some other time, is that there are different moral ways to argue. And I argue through that in terms of reasoning, moral reasoning. Martin does that too. And it all, if it's combined with compassion, really leads to better results in terms of human peace building and, and reconciliation. So that's the other thing. Keep in mind ethics. Find out people's ethics. Look for principles. Look for shared principles. Uh, and and it, all of the work and reconciliation will go better. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Pleasure. Take care. Take care, bye -bye. Professor. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, bye.